Welcome back to Nadan Jabang. We're coming to you live from the Hyatt Regency Hotel. This is the morning brew, but this morning there are very serious issues that we will be discussing. We're talking about the energy sector of Trinidad and Tobago. The energy sector contributes about 50% of the country's GDP. And if you factor in downstream as well as the support services, some may say it's as much as 68%, uh, depending on where you get your source of information from. Uh, just now we spoke with the head of the energy chamber and some of the interesting stories. The fact is Trinidad and Tobago is no longer the largest oil producing nation in the Caribbean region. Our story is changing. And speaking about the Caribbean conversation, well, this year, the conference will be talking about the Caribbean perspective. We have Prime Minister Mia Motley addressing the opening part of the conference this morning. Also, representatives from Suriname. Major discoveries have been made in Suriname as well. And the Guyana Chamber of Commerce is also present today. This has stakeholders come together to not just change a narrative, but understand where we are. Well, joining us this morning on the Morning Brew, we have uh, Mark Lupin, he's president of the National Gas Company of Trinidad and Tobago, one of the flagship entities, sort of the middle ground between the upstream, downstream, one of the major uh, in terms of contributors to government's GDP in terms of not just dividends and taxes, but also the negotiator, the aggregator, one of the big words I've been hearing recently. And also, we have Dr. Vernon Paltrow, the president of National Energy. Good morning, gentlemen. Thank you for joining us. Morning, you're welcome. Good morning, morning Trinidad. Now, Dr. Pelzer, let me start with you. In terms of this year's conference, tell me a little bit about the importance of this and the relevance of these conferences to the energy sector, particularly now. Well, uh, Hema, the energy sector is undergoing a dramatic transformation as we speak. It is critical that uh, as a country, we understand that it is not business as usual. We have to uh, essentially move towards uh, a different uh, thinking in terms of how we look at the development of the sector. That is why you see for um, the greater part of the uh, last couple of years and into the future, we'll be focusing on industries that uh, rely less on natural gas in terms of the development uh, of uh, the future the sector. And so basically what we're seeing is that uh, with the coming and stream of uh, you know, new territories and new, um, uh, new areas of exploration across the Caribbean, what we'll be doing is exploring and expanding the energy business, especially the civil sector outside of Trinidad and Tobago, while understanding that we have to build and continue to focus on um, keeping and securing the current business that we have. And NGC will talk a little bit about that. And speaking about NGC's role, you know, Mr. Lutan, looking at where NGC is now, the story of the Caribbean uh, narrative, and this year we're looking at the Caribbean's future, the energy future, how is NGC contributing to that goal? Well, I think if you look at the Latin American Caribbean region, you see that they have, uh, there's a lot of focus on uh, going to clean, cleaner energy. I mean, as you know, in the Caribbean, you see the countries affected by climate change and, and you see responses by countries in the region looking to replace expensive. Most of the Caribbean is actually 80% on petroleum products, which means there's a niche for Trinidad and Tobago with LNG right in the southern part of the Caribbean to fill that niche. Uh, so you, we have done a study on, on su supplying those markets um, with LNG, and I think that is going to um, take more shape in the year to come. Uh, you will see that also that there have been some regional issues going on with Guyana, Grenada, and even Venezuela for that matter in terms of medium-term gas supply, and, and I think that's very important as well. Speaking about medium term. When I spoke with uh, Dax Driver earlier this week, he said that we're at a point of inflection. How would you describe the state of the energy sector now? I think uh, uh, the energy sector really as a, is at a point of inflection. While uh, traditionally we have been a gas province, uh, it is a mature gas province. Uh, and in order to understand uh, where the future of the country is and what we have to do to ensure sustainability for the next 50 years, uh, we have to take the steps right now in terms of um, laying the groundwork uh, for future development of the sector. So. While we continue to um, uh, ensure that uh, the gas industries are supplied and uh, adequately um, positioned to um, contribute to the country and the economy, we have to start building for the future in terms of uh, uh, the foundation for renewable energy, for driving energy efficiency, because as we speak, uh, um, a lot of uh, probably about 10 to 15 percent of our gas currently goes to power generation. This is gas that can be better utilized uh, in the uh, downstream energy sector. And by driving efforts in energy efficiency and renewable energy, we can make that gas available. So what we are essentially doing is building and, uh, new industries uh, 
that uh, will rely on renewable energy or drive energy efficiency. And this is not just for Trinidad and Tobago, this is sorry, the Caribbean. I think uh, a recent study indicated that uh, by 2050, if uh, the entire region um, moved to renewable energy, what we'll be doing is saving by as much as 400 million US dollars uh, um, in terms of power infrastructure. And so we have to develop a, a structure that uh, is both uh, resilient, as you know, we are a small island development state, uh, and uh, there are issues uh, with weather and climate change and all of those sorts of things. Uh, so essentially what I'm saying is that now is the time for us to build the foundation for a new energy sector into the future that uh, while natural gas continues to be important and will be important to us, uh, we have to understand that the future uh, will be less reliant on natural gas. Looking at the rest, um, less reliant, Mr. Lugan, what is, this, you know, looking at the medium term and the long term, we're changing, we're talking about the changing Caribbean story. How do you see this story changing, the medium and the long term? I think, I think if we look at the, um, let's start with the, um, the way how power is used. Uh, if you look at how the, Caribbean region is evolving, you already see countries putting in policies that are going towards 100% renewables by 2030. Barbados is one of those um, countries that is actually doing that. Costa Rica is already at 100% renewables. And we also see countries like Chile with uh, energy plans up to 2050. So I guess in the context of energy uh, and having policy, it's going to be important that we have a long range plan that takes care of the medium to long term and to look at the energy mix compared to now. So when I know that there are major um, decisions that obviously come to your table every day in your capacity and I can't have you on set this morning without asking you about the story that was published on the Trinidad Guardian yesterday um, about Titan, Methnex and the, con and the negotiation with NGC. What is the sticking point? Well, you know, I won't comment specifically, Hema, on, on the specific companies or, or the sticking points of negotiation because that's a process that is live, it's ongoing. Um, and I would say, as you know, Metanex had published that they, there's an interim agreement until the end of March, April the 1st to be exact. Um, so that process is ongoing. I would, however, say that the, the challenge has been, as, as you know, the world has changed. Mm -hmm. And it's not only change in upstream pricing from the upstream producers, but it's also change on the downstream side where the markets are further away. Uh, as you know, the cheap gas prices in the U.S. has caused new plants to be built there. So therefore, the ammonia plants, methanol plants in Trinidad have to go further away to new markets, particularly Asia. Um, and that is also affecting the whole economics. So there, there's a change in world that we're grappling with right now. Are you concerned that they are going to pack up and leave? and it's going to change the composition or the state of the energy sector from Trinidad and Tobago? I, I, I would answer that by saying that there's no doubt that in the new world, the most efficient players, as we see globally, will survive. This is, this is, a, this is not a Trinidad issue only. We can look at the um, upstream in the indices and see the cost of equipment, capital equipment, over the last year, since the year 2000, and you would see in the last, you know, 10 years, 11 years, the indices going up by, you know, 80%. So, I mean, those are things that are happening globally. This is not a Trinidad um, issue only. Uh, the fact is, though, we've built up a lot of assets in Trinidad. And I think one of the most important issues, or two of the most important issues going forward, will be the sustainability of the pet chem sector and how we manage to make that work. Uh, on that basis, we are going to be hiring some third parties to talk to the entire value chain and to make sure that we can get that better for the next rounds. I do want to ask, and I know we are against time, and you also are part of a major player in today's energy conference discussions. Looking at government has spoken about the not just the collection ability or the amount of taxes and revenues that they've gotten in the energy sector, saying that the revenue is falling. The dividend pay, pay, payment to government this year, will it be significantly smaller than previous years? Uh, I would say that's largely true, and you could see all the data uh, around that. Um, I guess you, we are in a perfect storm because you can see that the, um, the LNG prices also has significantly fallen with due to an oversupply of LNG. But in this, I guess in this sector, you, you look long term and you make decisions for the long term. 
There's no doubt that we have to get more value from the chain. NGC itself is also transforming across the value chain. It's not in the aggregation business that is going to help the people of Trinidad and Tobago going forward. It's really how we look at the value from the upstream right to the marketing of cargoes and so on. And that, that's just how we have to go, just like the other companies. Now we know that it's going to be less. Is it going to be 50% less, 60% less, 80% less? Well, I won't comment on, uh, on that because some of those figures are also driven by, I would say, ministry uh, type information. So I would leave the minister to talk about those, those issues. That's well. So in terms of national energy, as we wrap this interview, how is it going to fit into NGC's mandate, not just here locally, but regionally? Okay, so as Mark would have indicated uh, in recent discussions, uh, uh, NGC is transforming into an integrated company. And uh, all of the functional companies in the NGC group, that's uh, Phoenix Park, uh, CNG, National Energy and NGC, are all expanding outside of Trinidad and Tobago. We have, um, uh, you know, taken the step uh, that uh, we need to go beyond the Trinidad and Tobago to ensure the sustainability of the energy sector. And so what you would see is that uh, different businesses are being uh, embarked upon by all of the companies along the value chain. For example, we at National Energy recently opened an office in Guyana to look after the interests of the NGC Group uh, in that region. As you mentioned earlier, Guyana is uh, perhaps the most exciting energy province in the Caribbean right now. So for NGC, it's important that we have a presence there. As well, even here in Trinidad and Tobago, last week we launched an initiative called TT Engage to improve the competitiveness of doing business within the downstream energy sector in Trinidad and Tobago. So all of these things are being done in order to ensure that we remain relevant as a company and NGC remains uh, relevant and contributing towards the development and the people of Trinidad and Tobago. So Pam, as we wrap this interview, NGC speaks about being a global leader and being relevant. How are you going to do that in a depressed an economy that is challenged? Well, I think the, the, the model of NGC has to change. We've been transforming ourselves in many ways. One is, um, as I said before, to move to an integrated gas mill and not just have the old model of buying and selling gas as, as, as it used to be, but also to look at strategic partnerships that matter. And you will see us for forging alliances even down in China where we are sending cargoes and so on. So you would see those policy changes taking shape. As Vernon mentioned, the movement as a group where there's far more synergies across the entire group and how we position ourselves regionally, how we position ourselves internationally will make a difference. You also see the whole company transforming in safety and governance and projects and how we do things, you know. Now I know that the uh, restaurant and Tobago can hear so much about what exactly NGC is doing. NGC and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us this morning. We're coming to you live from the Hyatt Regency Hotel. NGC, one of the key players and one of the key speakers this morning, as well as will be partaking in the workshops. I want to also remind you that there's a nominal fee uh, to enter the exhibitors area. It's uh, $50 and also uh, members also will get uh, some allowances as well, but definitely come down. There is a huge exhibitors area as well as the workshops and all of the discussions. There's a regional contingent present, not just from Guyana, from Suriname, but also the Barbados Prime Minister will be addressing this morning's conference. I'm Hema Rankison, and we're coming to you live from the Hyatt Regency Hotel.